Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, thank Radha Viswanathan for introducing us to this August audience here. And I'm indeed, uh, when this offer came to visit Mumbai for this purpose, even though tomorrow I'll be leaving for Turkey, actually, and then I thought it's an indeed a wonderful opportunity for me suddenly to meet personally to Sudhir Kulkarni, with whose you know, everyday newspaper article and hair and that I'm familiar with, in fact. And therefore, I really thought I must seize the opportunity here. I'm also thanked to Bilal, who actually organized this and has been organizing this conference here. Thank to Swat Kanan, in fact. Let me also thank to Professor uh, Zina Saukat Ali, who is present among us and whose writing I'm fairly aware with this. And in fact, uh, I had met a couple of years ago in Delhi when I was one of the organizers of Muslim Intelligentsia Meet in the midst of controversy of triple talaq and then the entire things that happened in fact. So thank you. I'm really, really glad to see you, ma'am, here. <laughs> thank you very much, in fact. Uh, having said this, um, the, the underlining idea of this today's program is uh, to, to inform you or probably to interact with you or what has come to known as Gulen Movement, which is known little in India, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is that currently I'm engaged with writing a book on the Gulen movements. And also is that uh, I'm in Turkey for the last two years, in fact. First, I visited Turkey as a visiting professor in the Fatih University, which is certainly the Gulen movement university. And currently I'm a professor in an university which has been introduced to here, in fact. Uh, let me frankly tell you a couple of things within this limitation of the 15, 20 days is that, that I do believe that uh, modern social science, which is basically premise on the power structure, has a serious limitation in, in understanding any peaceful non-violent movement. Because the whole discourse of the modern social science is basically based on the negative understanding of the human natures, that the human beings are primarily selfish. They are primarily egoistic. They are primarily violent, this and that. And therefore, probably we need the very strong state. We need the governments. We need the power structures. And this tendency to understand each and everything in terms of the power setup, in fact, beyond power. I mean, Foucault and many others they do not see beyond power. There exist any other things, actually. And therefore, what happened is that, that this entire discourse of the peace or the entire discourse of the goodwill, this entire discourse of cooperation, this entire discourse of philanthropy, this entire discourse of altruism, somehow it actually becomes idealist. And it is not something the real which really needs to be engaged with. And therefore, what is really very interesting is that, that what really emerged in the Gandhian movement and the Green movement is that it is actually beyond the paradigm of the modern social sciences that does not have really phraseology to understand this kind of the movement. That we are actually in Turkey, I can see that many of the industries donating million of the liras, I mean, for the educational and the philanthropy movements like this. I mean, we may do not have so much of philanthropic tradition here, but in Turkey, probably, the, I mean, the movement is known as hijmat actually, and hijmat means service, and, and service is not something. Is a, is a monopoly of Turkey. I mean, service is, is in every society. But what is really remarkable by virtue of my observation in Turkey is that, that it has become their everyday value. It has become an everyday value. And probably one of the Gulen's contribution towards the peace, I would like to say, is that how to transform Islam's into everyday value. <laughs> in everyday value of goodness, of the hard works, of the honesties, of the dedications, of respecting each other's identity, how to, because these are the ideas, that's fine, but how to transform them, and how to motivate them, and how to really operationalize them in everyday, actually, in fact. I think that is one of the remarkable contributions with Fatehullah Gulen over the 50 or 60 years he has really made, in fact. Having said this, uh, uh, there are the, 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 the entire Gulen discourse, which I believe is that, and as far as the contribution of the peace is concerned, this is in the, ultimately this end is the moral and ethical transformations of the human beings. That's number one. And in order to exercise, in order to realize this, the moral and ethical transformations of the individual being is that, then it has two, three, I mean, you could call it agencies. I mean, this is how social agencies, educational, you, you call it agency, which, which is basically the modern term is that, and therefore he would like to rely thoroughly on the questions of the education, that education as a very powerful instrument 
of understanding each, each other, of promoting the mutual values, or also promoting the mobility, in fact. But what makes Fatehullah Gulen's understanding education fit fundamentally, for example, that the entire modern understanding of education is that, that if you kindly remember is that, that while the entire West was experimenting with the modern educations with a very high degree of professionalism, there is no doubt about that, while laying down the very fundamental, very strong research traditions in the West, and in the 19th century, while they are de developing the democratic institutions in the Euro major parts of the Europe in the 18th century, simultaneously those intellectuals who were also involved, they were basically colonizing the other parts of the world. And I see that there is a fundamental disjunction here. And Europe, that came out with the idea of democracy of the humanisms, also came out with this idea of the colonizations, in fact, simultaneously. And therefore, you find there's a remarkable diarchy. There's a remarkable dualism. And dualism is that while Europe can experiment with democracy, India cannot experiment with democracy because they lack certain things. What they lack, they will never tell you. And therefore, in the process, what happened is that, that in their colonizations, basically, they have also not only helped in building the democratic institution, but they also destroyed the inner potentials of those democratic, which actually survive in the, in the, in the, in the, in the basically the post-colonial societies, the non-Western societies, in fact. What emerged in Fatehullah Gulen is that, is that this professionalism is fine. But if this professionalism is not guided by the moral considerations, if this professionalism is not guided by the ethical considerations, <coughs> then certainly you will produce the atom bomb and you will drop at Japan. That you are capable of doing that, you know? And, and, and therefore, that knowledge systems, that education cannot be the inclusive, in fact. You know, therefore, what happened is that in the Western trajectory, that the entire education is based on the notion of the others, the civilizing nations, the progress, these transformations of the science, science is fine. But the moment you transform science into positivism, the moment you made the science ideological, the moment you transform science into a truth, that become fundamentally problem because from that point of view, then the religion become irrelevant. Religion become prestance. Then the religion become private. That means religion cannot have any, religion cannot produce any social good. You know, it, 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 it is something irrational. It needs to be really controlled. It, it, it needs to be really tamed and this and that. What is really, and therefore, this has also affected, this modern narrative has also affected uh, the, the, the interpretations of the Islams. And over the last 400 interpretations of the Islam, is basically what happened is that as the power structure at the international level actually changed, and the Muslims actually became the peripheral structures, in fact, that the entire theology within Islam developed, which is a strong, very powerful power content, in fact. A very power that the political Islam came, then this Islam came, then that Islam, notion of the Islamic state came, which are ultimately connected with the idea of the nation states and the powers. So unless and until Islam will become powerful, there was, there was no otherwise. Against this, Fatehullah Gulen actually try to interpret in terms, I mean, it is two things. One is that, that it would like to present Islam as an ethical and the moral discourse. That Islam is not the question of identity anymore. And I think that is something very important, actually. This idea that I would be Islamic, I would be Muslims, unless and until I'll perform my Muslim in a particular way, Unless and until I have a small pajama and I'll have a dadi and I'll, I'll perform the namaz in a very particular way and I'll have a sahaba like this, I'll have a like this. This question of identity, you know, that this transforming Islam into the identity, you know, he debunked that. And what he says is that, that the Islam is basically moral. I mean, his entire exercise of presenting Islam in form of the love. You know, that the God is something that love, universe is something to be loved, humanity is something to be loved. And he's trying to harness the goodness you know, and giving the alternative moral interpre ethic, ethical interpretation of Islam that was somehow lost in a conflict between the West and the Islam. To what extent the conflict between the West and Islam is imaginary, I do not know. But today, if you look at probably the Muslim participation in the global discourse of terrorism, probably the participation of the Muslim is much more higher than any other communities. There could be many structural reasons for that. You know, but here is probably one of the person who is trying to, and, and, and this is the movement, I mean, which, which if you look at the literatures, I mean, you will find that this is the democratic movement, this is the civil society movement, this is the social capital movement, all kind of the modern philology you can find out, actually, this is the faith-based movements. But in the ultimate analysis, it is the movement 
that is actually derived or based on the Islam inspirations. And it is, it is, it is basically built on what they call the prophetic models. Follow the conducts of the Prophet Muhammad, in fact. Probably all movement actually begins from theirs, actually, you know. So when the Sahaba and this, and it's a very thoroughly Islamic movement, but has a very different understanding and different visions of the humanism, in fact. The other things uh, which is equally very important in this education, so the interfaith activity is that, is that it has done, uh, uh, I would say, is that, that this is the one movement which does not have a conception of other. This is the one movement which does not have a conception of other. And to this extent, what the movement has really done remarkably is that, is that it has, I would say that it has really uplifted the Turkish Muslim, I'm not sure the other Muslim, certainly not the South Asian Muslims, who are basically accustomed to live in the, in the conspiracy paradigm, that they have lifted the significant parts of Turkish Muslim above this conspiracy paradigm. That the world is conspiring against the Muslims right from the Israel to America to everywhere, that is conspiring. And we have to be alert, we have to defend the Islam, and not only you have to defend Islam, they will prescribe you in what form you should defend it. It, it, it is not merely the question of defending Islam, it is all the question of prescribing this particular format in which the violence becomes central, in which, for example, Tabliki Jamaat are political become central, in which the political movement become very central, but in this, and in fact, I, in my interview, I asked that what the Gulen movement has given to Turkish Muslims. And many of the Turks would say to me, the movement has given me that I can move globally. And very proudly they said to me. The movement has given me that I can move globally without any barriers. And it has injected the motiv motivations to compete with others, that there is a no perceptions of the others. I have to compete in the business, in the trades, in the education, and this and that. As a result is that, that there is a remarkable, they actually build a very powerful, inclusive educational development, actually. This, this I mean, many uh, uh, other things. The other things which, which is actually struck me is that, that the movement is known education worldwide, they are establishing schools. They are not into the business of, because if you remember, I mean, Professor Jin, uh, she would be here to actually correct me, is that most of the 18th century and the 19th century Islamic paradigm and the modernist movement, they have dealt with the questions of the education only in the realm of the higher educations. So they would like to have the higher educational institutions. They would like to have a discourse between the Islam and science. They would like to have a discourse on the Islam and modernity. In fact, the discourse on Islam and modernity is almost 90% of all the discourse on Islam today, in fact. So the thrust is on the higher, in the higher realm of the educations. What Fatehullah Gulen did is actually is that it is not a question of the compatibility between the reasons in the Islam or the Islam and the science and the Islam and democracy. These are basically the irrelevant questions. Let's have the schools, the primary school, the secondary school, that even if you wish to build the university, and even if you do not have the moral and ethical people whom you, from where would you produce that? So that the schools becomes extremely important. How to have the moral and ethical person is a fundamental question actually, you know. And, and and inherent in this discourse is this, is that the movement is thoroughly non-ideological. Because the movement actually believe, and Fatehullah Gulen believe, that ideology is the counterproductive of democracy. If you are ideological, you cannot be democratic. It's as simple as that. Yeah, so left movement is very difficult because I come from the left movement. I've been the part of the Naxal movement in Bihar for almost 10 years. So I know, I have been into that. You know, and, and the, the enemy perception is very much there, actually. You know, so as long as you're ideological, whether left, right, or center, wherever you are, you have a certain perception of others. And you have the other, then you cannot be democratic, because you're unable to transfer that. So the movement does not emphasize. It's a thoroughly de-ideological, you know. And therefore, what you find in the movement is that, that there is a no word called Islamicism. In fact, if anybody who uses the term Islamism for the Gulen movements, they are particularly very clear. They would say the Islam-led inspirations or Islam-led movements. So there is a fundamental difference between Islam, Islamic, and Islamicism. In fact, they are even allergic to use this particular word Islamic. You know, because the Islamic means you are fixing something. This is how it should be, which is absolutely not in the reality. So they actually emphasize the word Islam, neither Islamic nor uh, Islamism, in fact. Uh, the, the other thing is that, uh, because in the short time, 
uh, that the other things is that, uh, which, which is certainly, which is related with the questions of the religious harmony, and that certainly depends on the questions of the notions of the others. Because as long as you are having the others, you would not be in a position to interact with the others. Therefore, one of the foundation of the Gulen movement and Gulen movement that it accepts you with your identity, with your all cultures, in fact. And fundamentally, the movements actually believes, it fundamentally believes that it is a, a diehard Islam-inspired movement, that God has uh, 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 appointed every messenger for every communities, for every nation. So even though Islam has a very serious problem with the people who worship ideal, such as, for example, Hindu community in India, there's a serious theological problem, and I hope you would not mind, sir, the serious theological problems. But even for that position, if you look at Gulen discourse, is that, that he genuinely believed that there must be one prophet. Whether the people had followed that prophet is a different question. Therefore, you must accept that identity as it is. And you must interact with that identity. And you must accept their discourse. Only then a certain kind of, for example, symbiosis could be established. Only then there could be the basis of the negotiation. Only there could be the basis of the dialogue. <laughs> Therefore, otherwise the dialogue would not be possible. All the dialogue will then suffer from the superiority complex of, for example, the glorification of one's religious traditions, in fact. Then there, 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 there cannot be any dialogue as such. Therefore, one of the things which actually e emerged in the Gulen movement is that there's a remarkable impasse on the interfaith dialogue. You know? But still, I am I made to, to see that there is a no intrafaith dialogue. And I think that that is the one thing which probably they will have to probe. And that is also required, that intrafaith. This interfaith is fine, the Hindu Muslim fine, the Hindu Christian fine, the Muslim Christian fine. But what about among the Muslims who belong to the different, you know, because they have a different imagination. A Barelvi has a different imagination of Prophet Muhammad. A Dubandi has a different imagination of the Prophet Muhammad. There is no consensus on the role of Prophet Muhammad. What about how to establish peace and tolerance among the Muslims who subscribe to different understanding of the Islams? So that has not come, but they're very much into the interfaith and the other kinds of things. As far as the questions of the relevance for India is concerned, I would like to say two things. One is that, that there is a similar situation between the Indian Muslims and the Turkish Muslims, which I have observed. What happened in Turkey is that when the Kamal Atatürk revolution began, in the, secular, um, the, the kind of the French secularism that was actually introduced in France, and uh, the school became very ideological. It became of the source of the socializations. And, 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 and people have the perception that what is being done in the name of secularism is basically atheism, is, is basically positivism. And therefore, it is likely to <coughs> undermine the Islamic values. Therefore, many of the Anatolian parents in the rural, they could not send their children to the government schools. And in fact, you will surprise to know that who are the sections, and now I lived in Turkey, who are the sections and the classes who are actually upholder of secularism? It is not majority Muslims. Oh. It is basically the diehard leftist, or, the, or what you call basically, the, there is a division in Turkey which, which is called White Turks and the Black Turks, <laughs> you know, and these White Turks are, <laughs> and these White Turks are mostly secularist, Kemalis, army, bureaucracies, who normally majority of them basically come from the Alvi minority communities, not the majority Sunni Muslims, because many of the parents did not send, and since they did not send their children, they could not be absolved in the bureaucracies. Similar situation exists in Indian Muslims actually. The parents such certainly about the girls. The only thing is the Jamia Milia Islamia, Aligarh Muslim University, Jamia Hamdar, but they could not cater the demands of 20 crore or 15 crore of the Muslims actually. This is the bullshit propositions, in fact. And many of the Muslims are reluctant to send their children to the other university precisely. They believe that the Hindu culture in the government schools or the private is likely to compromise their Islamic values and this and that. I think, as far as the Muslim come from that point of view I'm speaking, we certainly need with the Gulen type of movements here, whose image is actually Islamic, but it run a secular institutions. One of the biggest contribution of the Gulen movement is that it is a diehard Islamic movement, but it doesn't build madarsa, it doesn't build mosques, it builds secular schools. And it runs the schools on the national curriculum, on the international curriculums, because it actually believes that the education is basically a secular entity. 
And what Gulen movement has done is that, that for long, I mean, the, the, the entire Islamic knowledge system was basically confined to this idea of seeking the Islamic educations. This idea basically the transmitted science and the natural science. And this transmitted science will be on the higher plane and the natural science will be lower plane. What Gulen movement has done is that he has basically transformed from seeking Islamic education to making education as an Islamic value. So you are absolutely free. You are absolutely free to have access to any kind of the education systems and to do research. And then this is how the secular educational institution, because in Turkey, you cannot have the religious, I mean, unlike India, where you can run the madrasa, in Turkey, you cannot run it. Because it's a secular state, secular completely. I would not call secular, I mean, I would not call Turkey as a secular because it is the state that actually controls the religion, basically. It also controls that what the imam of the mosque is going to, on the Friday mosque is going to read out. So that much of control is there. So in my definition of secularism, it actually doesn't occur actually, you know. But the situation is similar. If, 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 if we have such kind of the Muslim sensitivities, I would personally incline to let the Muslim trust and the Muslim NGOs run these schools so that it will inject that kind of confidence among the Muslim community. Because Aligarh remain one of the universities which actually recruit the large number because the parents believe their girl will be much more safe and secure and Islamically fine than any other GNU and other kind of the educational institution. So we need that kind of the institution and build a powerful secular institutions as such. The second which I will believe is that is, is, is with regard to this uh, conflict between the Hindu and the Muslims or the ethnic conflicts or even the caste conflict is that I believe that at, 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 in one of the writings that uh, Fateullah Gulen is popularly known as Hosef Handy, which is a basically respected teacher actually, you know. So in one of the, he says that, unfor I mean, he says is that, that had not the Quran been revealed in, in, in Arabic, had not the Quran been revealed in Arabic, I would have preferred to read Quran in Turkish, you know? There are two interpretations of this. He doesn't explain what does. As far as I am concerned, one is that the Fatehullah Gulen is diehard nationalist, Turkish nationalist, because he sees Turkish. The second interpretation would be is that, that probably the Turkish Islam is far more inclusive than any other version of the Islams. And the reason is that, while the Arab, to my understanding, while the Arab perception, I mean, for example, Turkey and Iran is probably the only territory that has resisted the urbanizations of Islam very strongly. You know, Turkey is, an, is also the place which actually, I would say, that gave birth to the Sufism that went to the North Africa and many other places, in fact. Turkey is also the place, the Ottoman Empire, that actually built the multicultural Ottoman Empire, multicultural states. And therefore, the, the kind of the narratives of the Islam that actually developed in the Ottoman Empire, that was far more multicultural, that were far more tolerant of the other religious tradition, like for example, what Akbar did probably here actually, in fact, in India, in fact. And therefore, speaking from that point of view, is that if we are in a position to have that Turkish, which actually combines the multiculturalism, which actually combines the question of differences, which actually combines, take into the consideration of the situation, is probably far more inclusive that the Arab perceptions of the Islam that is built on the monoculture. I mean, the, the, the entire Wahhabi movement totally destroyed. Totally destroyed, massacred, butchered, particularly. He went even to the extent of destroying the tomb of Prophet Muhammad. It went to that extent because in their imagination, that there should be no middleman between God and individual. But that is something very mechanical understanding of Islam, actually. There are many mechanical understanding of the Islam. So what Wahhabi movement developed and from their many political Islam is that, I mean, it, it, it is like something Protestantism that you read Quran, it is the word jihad, and let us have a violence. But it totally destroys the in between traditions. What Fatehullah Gulen is doing is that he is basically re injecting and re and probably re giving the, 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 the bringing back the Islamic tradition built on the Sufis. And, and for Fatehullah Gulen, Sufism is, is, is not something the dance and the maulid, or for example, or, or, or or what you call, but it's basically the remembrance of God every time, all the time, all the time, that you are in, that you are in love with the God, because you're caring with the God, you know? So, so that, I mean, that, that means that moral and ethical principles, that you have to remember God. It, it is in that transformation, and I think is that from that point of view, for the Ullah Gulen discourse is extremely important for any kind of the harmony or any kind of the conflict within the Indian context. Thank you very much. <laughs>